Good morning. My name is Pat Allen, and I'm here today with uh, Larry Stone King at the Cincinnati State Community College campus in Middletown, Ohio. And we are here to do an interview and a video of uh, Larry Stone King for the United States Library of Congress. And it is through the Hamilton, the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library and the program locally is administered by Brian Powers. Our cameraman today is uh, Dave Gillen. And uh, let me start out first, Larry, by thanking you for your willingness to be interviewed and videotaped for this project, and thank you for your service. Thank you. So uh, why don't you tell us your full name? Larry Stone King. And where do you live, Larry? I live in Franklin right now. Franklin, Ohio? Yes. All right, and uh, where were you born and when? Uh, I was born in uh, 1951 in Richwood, West Virginia. All right, and uh, how long did you live in Richwood? Well, I was actually born there. Uh, the where did you live? Webster Springs. And where is that and near any town we might know it's, of? It's nowhere. It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, it's in uh, Webster County. Uh, it's probably uh, three mountains away from Richwood where I was actually born. All right. Uh, what were your mother and father's names? My father is William Jennings, and my mother is Daisy Leela. What was her maiden name? Her maiden name was Keener. Keener? K-E-E-N-E-R. -E 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 mm -hmm. And um, what did uh, what did your dad do? What kind of work did he do? Well, earliest I remember he was a, a coal miner. Then he, uh, he bought a, a coal truck, dump truck. And he uh, attempted to go big and bought another dump truck, and uh, that didn't work out. So uh, we ended up moving several times around West Virginia, trying to for him to get something decent to work. All right. uh, he came uh, he came to Ohio uh, to visit his sister and and got a job in Columbus and uh, then came back to uh, West Virginia and got, uh, and got our, our family. And we moved to Columbus. What part of Columbus did you live in? I was born uh, there. Hilltop. Okay, out on the west side? Mm -hmm. Yep, off of West Broad Street. So then we went from, uh, from there to uh, West Dayton and he worked for a company called Clark Oil Company, and they uh, collected used oil from various facilities. I guess they were recycling it back in the late 50s. And uh, so we ended up staying in, in the Dayton area for, uh, well, uh, what's left of our family still there in Dayton. So, All right. Yeah. So, uh you have brothers and sisters? I have one natural brother. I have uh, two half-brothers. I have uh, a uh, half-brother that was killed in Korea. I'm sorry. In 1954. And uh, the half-sister that uh, kind of estranged Trump. I haven't seen her since, since my dad died in 1982. All right. I'm sorry to hear about your father. Did your mother work outside the home uh, while you were younger? She did. She, what kind uh, of work did she do? She was a waitress. Well, let me get this in here first. She was a rosy riveter during World War II. Oh, she was? Yes. And where did she work? Uh, Baltimore. Baltimore? Mm -hmm. How long did she do that? I don't know. Her and her sister went from Webster Springs, West Virginia, somehow back in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, word traveled that they were looking for people and and they uh, somehow managed to get to Baltimore and, and put together planes. Putting planes together? Yeah. Did you have any idea what uh, what planes they were working on? No. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. I haven't talked to anybody who's uh, 
experience uh, working in the assembly of uh, war materials. Uh, but outside the house, uh, she was a waitress uh, for s several years. Then uh, one of our neighbors got her uh, a job at Miami Valley Hospital, and uh, she ended up being there for about 25 years. And, right. What'd and she retired. do at Miami Valley? She was a transcriptionist transcriptionist in medical records. All right, and Miami Valley is in, there in Dayton. In Dayton, Ohio, right. yeah. Um, so with moving around, you probably went to a number of different grade schools. Oh, a lot, a lot. What, what grades, what was your school that you uh, graduated from in the eighth grade? Lincoln Elementary in Dayton. Okay, and about when was that? 63. 65. 65. And then where did you go to um, high school? Wilbright in, in Dayton, Ohio. When did you graduate there? I would have graduated in 1969. Uh, you say you would have. What did you do? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it was uh, at 16 how you're in love, and when it uh, something happens, you do some stupid things. So, uh, so you got married? A uh, couple weeks after I turned 17, I uh, listed in the Marine Corps. Oh, all right. So uh, I was going to show her uh, I'm going to go put my life in danger. So, uh, you know, 17 years and uh, three weeks later, I was on a plane to San Diego, California for a Marine Corps boot camp. Well, let, let's go back uh, a second. Uh, where, where did you go to enlist? In Dayton, Ohio. All right. And how long was it between the time you actually signed the enlistment papers before you, you were called up? Uh, I signed the papers on March 10th and I left March 20th. All right. And uh, what did your parents think about uh, you joining the Marines at that early age? I think they were concerned about it, but uh, I had a brother that uh, had served in the Marine Corps, and uh, fortunately for him, he spent his time in, in uh, Hawaii and uh, Japan, All right. uh, chauffeuring a general around. So, so that wasn't bad duty. That wasn't bad duty, and so I had a brother uh, that, that previously served in Vietnam and. Uh, uh, got a purple heart over there. Good. Um, you mentioned you had one brother that was killed in Korea. Yes. Uh, what branch was he in? Marine Corps. And do you remember where he was killed or how, what circumstances were for that? Uh, all I know is he was in a, uh, I guess it was a bunch of them in a, in a box car. Uh, it was in, in January. I'm sure it was very cold. And they had uh, had kerosene heaters in the box car. And I guess at some point in time, probably in the middle of the night, the thing got knocked over or fell over or something, and and caught everything on fire. And and uh, when you say a box car, you're talking about a railroad box car. Yeah, yeah. All right. uh, were, so were you at home when the news came that uh, it died? I was uh, I was three years old, so I <clears throat> so I don't remember him. Uh -huh. uh, we've got pictures of him holding me, uh, but yeah, yeah. Nice. He's buried in the uh, National Cemetery in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. All right. Uh, I've made several trips down there. Oh, good, good. Uh, well, let's go on. Uh, so you went in on the 10th, and uh, 10 days later, you're on your way. And you go out to San Diego? Yes. What uh, what uh, uh, what facility, what camp out there? Uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. And uh, how long was your boot camp? It was, it was uh, they were originally 13 weeks. And uh, I guess since we were cannon fodder and uh, they needed troops, uh, we only ended up uh, eight weeks training. All right. So then uh, where did where did they send you? 
I was uh, lucky and not lucky. I uh, I was scheduled to go to uh, radio operator school there at San Diego, and uh, while I was waiting for that class to start, somebody came to me and asked me uh, that uh, if I wanted to change from radio operator to electronic technician because they had a class starting and they needed somebody. So, you know, not knowing any better and following orders, I said, okay. <laughs> and I was, I was terrible at electronics, absolutely terrible. Uh, but I guess that was a sign from God that uh, I wasn't meant to walk around with a, a target on my back. And that's the lucky part. That's the lucky part. What's the unlucky part? Well, yeah, I, I, I kind of thought that was being cool, but uh, you know, once I realized what, you know, what big targets they were, especially with that big uh, ten or twelve foot antenna coming out of the back of that radio, top of that radio, uh, it, it wasn't so good. All right. So, uh, where did where did you leave from in the states? Dayton, Ohio. You came, you came here for uh, uh, leave before they shipped you overseas? Right. Uh, when they shipped you out, where did you ship out from? Uh, attended uh, what they call staging battalion in, in uh, Camp Pendleton. And uh, that was two weeks. And at the end of that two weeks, uh, we all shipped out. Uh, shipped out and shipped to... <coughs> Ship to Vietnam via via Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, Okinawa, Japan. So, did you fly, or were, were you we on a ship? No, flew. We flew. Yeah. What kind of plane did you fly in? It was commercial. Commercial. Commercial airline. Yeah. To Japan, and same thing, commercial to Okinawa. Actually, it surprised me. We actually flew commercial uh, into Da Nang, South Vietnam. I'm like, why? How? How is this? How is this jet landing in a war zone? <laughs> but uh, what, what, what airlines was it? You remember? No. But uh, did you see Da Nang from uh, from the air? No, they brought us in at nighttime. Uh, it was in the middle of the night. Uh, all I remember is uh, it was hot <coughs> and the smell. It was a terrible smell. Now that doesn't tell me anything. A bad smell could be yeah. a number of things. What did it smell yeah. like? It smelled like musty, moldy smell to me. Uh, I could hear explosions uh, off in the distance. Uh, I was, uh, me and a couple other guys were picked up by a uh, a driver and taken to uh, the naval support activity in Da Nang. Well, what unit uh, were you in? What what unit, division, company, or whatever? I started out in uh, Fifth Com Battalion, Third uh, Marine Division, Third Marine Amphibious Force, and uh, I was there about uh, two weeks. And I, I got sent to uh, Navy uh, Security Agency for a, a month. Is this happening over in Vietnam? Yes. All right. Yeah. And uh, so I spent <coughs> spent a month with them, uh, learning some of the uh, things that they do there, uh, as far as the communications equipment. Then I went back to uh, back to the third math uh, facility, which was called Camp Horn, and uh, about a week week later, uh, uh, CH forty six helicopter 
uh, took off from the landing area right next to Camp Horn and his uh, rudders got caught on some wires and uh, <clears throat> he flipped over and went went down right out from our barracks. As he was coming in to pick you up he he was he was he was departing with a load of uh, of Arvin uh, South Vietnamese soldiers and uh, they think that the way it it, it went that uh, it was it was overloaded uh -huh. and uh, yeah that that field was completely surrounded by concertina wire uh, because uh, there was an ammo dump right there so when I ran out of the, uh, most of us ran out of the barracks towards that sound uh, It, it, Were there any survivors in the in the crash? No. No, it immediately uh, exploded and caught fire, and uh, uh, live rounds were going off, and uh, and there was just you know if anybody survived it, they didn't survive it for very long, and there was no way anybody could. Uh, just run over there and attempt to help anybody. Uh huh. So that was. Uh, so was there any chance that you would have been on that uh, copter? No, no, no. That was uh, <clears throat> even though it was a uh, you know, hundred hundred yards away. It was uh, my first experience with mass mass. Uh, death like that. Uh huh. And uh, and this was at Camp Horn. Yeah. Yeah. The Camp Horn was that right outside Dunang? Yes. That's uh. That's where all the the celebrities and big shot uh, military brass and, and everybody came in and, and stayed. It was uh, it was the uh, Marine Corps Command Headquarters. And they had uh, what's called the war room, and uh, it was pretty far underground. Uh, you had to have top secret clearance to get in there. And did you get that when you were there at the Navy? Uh, no, I had uh, I had a secret clearance in order to work in the, on the, the cryptologic equipment. We uh, we had cards that had a uh, hundred cords that plugged into a hundred different numbered slots on this card, and at midnight we had to change our card. Uh, Honolulu changed their card and the Pentagon changed their card. And they were all the same, and they were done exactly the same time. So they could send secure, secure messages back and forth. And that was done at midnight every night. And were you part of that? Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, it was not a lot of room to, to <laughs> <laughs> to get these, all these. Uh, yeah, well, show me your hands. Your, yeah. your hands, your hands aren't aren't little, and I uh, bet you had problems with that, didn't you? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, I don't think uh, I don't remember anybody uh, messing up. I don't remember any glitches in in uh, in the way that was that was done, but it it got the job done. Uh, I recently visited the National Cryptologic uh, Museum in uh, near Fort Meade, Maryland, right next to National Security Agency, and uh, 
the equipment we used and, and worked on back in the late 60s are, are dinosaurs. <laughs> They're just uh, compared to the, to the equipment now. It's just. Well, what were you called uh, while you were doing that work? What? Cryptologic technician. All right. What What was your rank? I started out in. Uh, I got I got PFC Z two when I started electronic school. Uh, when I graduated from there, I was uh, promoted to uh, lance corporal, which was E three. During my time in Vietnam, I was meritoriously promoted to Corporal E4, and uh, eventually made uh, Sergeant E5 uh, before my enlistment was up. Uh, was, was, uh, were you promoted to the, uh, Sergeant E5 while you were still over in uh, Vietnam? No, it was uh, when I was at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Uh, I was promoted in uh, December 1971 and uh, discharged in March of 72. Do you remember what date it was that you got to uh, Da Nang first time? Uh, yeah, it was uh, August 18th. Of what year? Uh, 1969. And how long were you in Vietnam total? Just a few days short of a year. Uh, did you... Uh, have any duty stations other than the uh, Da Nang area, the, the uh, Camp Horn? Yeah, I spent, uh, I was sent temporary duty to Army's 37th Signal Battalion, which was near uh, Da Nang Air Base. And uh, I spent about three months there uh, running the uh, the radio relay station. There were two of us Marines there, and we alternated duty. And uh, what would you do? Twelve-hour shifts? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes twenty-four. Just, but you know, where are you going to go? But I did find out that there's an army. Uh, it called the. Uh, uh, black cats and they were like a taxi service and you could just go and uh, tell them where you wanted to go and they would take you there. Now, what do you mean by go wherever you wanted to go? Go to other towns or other camps or what? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, made an acquaintance with uh, one of the guys in another another area and uh, so one day I just went and <laughs> went and asked them if they'd take me to Hoi An, and uh, they said, hop on board. So that was my first experience in a Huey, and uh, that was uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, well, ex explain that for they us. They fly low and they fly nose down. I've seen that in the movies. On the tops of the trees to keep keep from uh, attracting a lot of sniper fire. Uh, if they're higher in the air, they'll make better targets. So they go down, go down top of the tree line and uh, occasionally take, take a limb with them. <laughs> so, so were you, uh, you and the pilot the only ones on board then? No, there was a whole crew on. Uh, yeah, I don't think we even had a machine gun or anything, it was just, uh, pilot and co-pilot and uh, so I spent the day uh, there visiting uh, visiting that guy and uh, Hoi An was the uh, uh, where the uh, fifth uh, fifth career fifth the rocks the, the Royal, Royal Marines the Korean and uh, they were they were based there. And uh, and when when I got off the hill, the Huey, uh, I was smelling this this odor, and it was uh, 
not far from the landing area, uh, the Koreans, uh, they make a vegetable thing called kimchi. And there was all these pots sitting there buried in, uh, near, right near the, the sand, near the top of the sand. And, and they, they called them uh, uh, kimchi pits. And uh, I wouldn't try that. I, <laughs> Just the smell of the. This, yeah. Was it, it kind was, of a soup or what was it? Yeah, yeah it was like soup. But uh, it was like the purpose of, of keeping it in, in these pots and, and, and in the sand was uh, f to ferment. Oh, okay. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Nah, so I passed on that. So but interestingly, I, uh, after visiting there for four, five, six hours, uh, I needed to get back to Da Nang, and I went over to the to the uh, landing area and uh, was standing around waiting for waiting for a ride, and uh, a civilian came up to me. A civilian? Mm -hmm. Asked me, American asked me where I was going, and I told him Da Nang. And he said, well, hop in, I'll give you a lift. So oh, he's a civilian? Yeah. And he's flying one of the, is he flying one of the? He's flying a, a unmarked, like a Piper Cub. Oh, okay. And uh, so he gave me a, a, a lift back to uh, Da Nang Air Base, and uh, Got back to the unit okay. And years later, I was thinking, you know, who was that guy? And I figured it was it was Con Air, you know, a CIA guy or somebody that, uh -huh. uh, you know, was. So, in the how long was your flight uh, back to that? Oh, night? half hour. So, did you chat with him? Did he tell you why he was there or anything? No. Nah. No. Nah. I don't recall even asking him, uh, but yeah, he had to be CIA or somebody that over there that uh, had things to do. How did the Korean Marines uh, treat you, or did you interact with them at all? They were they were a little peculiar. Uh, first time I encountered them, I was in the enlisted club. With a couple of other guys, and having we were having a beer, and, and uh, there was two or three uh, Rock Marines sitting at the table with us, and one was sitting next to me, and uh, you know, all of a sudden there's a hand on my leg, <coughs> and uh, I looked at my buddy. I says, "Man, I don't know, but I'm getting ready to punch this sucker." I said, he's got my hand on my leg. And he goes, no, 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 no. He said, that's just their way of showing friendship. He said, it's not. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now I think it was, uh, I think it was George Bush. Uh, the second was in South Korea and, and he was walking down to somewhere uh, with the uh, president of South Korea and they were uh, walking along uh, holding hands, so. It's 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 their culture. Uh huh. Uh huh. So uh, ROK is Republic of Korea, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's for for somebody that might uh, not know that fifty years down the road when they see this. Um, so uh, that that base is that was that at the Korean base where you went to visit, or was that encounter down at uh, Da Nang? Or that was that was where I. Uh, you took the ride up for a day. Yeah, he took me. You know, the guy in the airplane that took me back to Da Nang. Well, what was that? What was that Korean base? Uh, what was the purpose of that being where it was? Do you know? They ran. Uh, they ran patrols out of there. Uh, you know, my buddy said they would. Uh, they would come back. They might be out for a week on a patrol, and they'd come back. And uh, you know, most of them would go into their 
tents or whatever and, and uh, to relax and said there was always two or three that just turned right around and went back out again. They just, uh, you know, I guess they were just uh, crazy. <laughs> now, was your buddy stationed there? Or? Yeah, he was assigned there. Yeah. And what did he do at that? He was, uh, he was also a radio relay uh, operator. All right. What? If uh, we supported the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and if uh, if a guy up in, in uh, northern part of the country, uh, Hoi An or uh, the DMZ near the DMZ, uh, they could be on the radio uh, trying to get a hold of somebody, and it goes from them to the radio relay station, and then it gets forwarded to who they're who they're trying to. Uh, to reach and uh, so I had you know we were practically always on the phone and uh, you know it would be somebody that was under fire and they were trying to get uh, air support or something and and it was uh, it was very uh, very critical that uh, you know their uh, their radios were were going where where they were supposed to go. So, so they could get the uh, communications uh, timely mm -hmm. uh, and get the support for the fellows under fire. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you remember any outstanding uh, communications you had in any one or two or several instances that uh, no, was sticks I, in your mind? I just know you can, you can, you can tell. Uh, when there's a, a sense of panic in somebody's voice that uh, the shit's hitting the fan and uh, you, you're not thinking about, you know, chit-chatting with them. Uh, you know, I'd keep them on, uh, keep the line open uh, and and go back and trace down the problem and, and replace, replace a circuit board or a panel and uh, and uh, to get their communications up and, and always, always resolve the problem. Uh, Did you have any instances where you directly called fire in to? No, no, no. You're no. Always, you were always just a relay guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Were you, were you stationed any place uh, other than right there near Da Nang? No. Uh, I visited quite a few places. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to be like John Wayne. Uh, you know, since I wasn't in a uh, a uh, combat unit, uh, every time there was a convoy going somewhere, uh, I'd volunteer to to go along and ride shotgun. Not doing your communication job, just riding shotgun. Just riding shotgun on the convoys, or uh, you know, just a couple of couple of vehicles maybe uh, would go somewhere, and uh, so I would go, uh, hoping to see some some action. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's good. Uh, you never, you know, you never know when that bullet's going to be have your name on it. Right. So, uh, yeah, I was uh, very fortunate. Uh, the very last uh, travel I did, I had uh, s five or six days left in, in Vietnam, and uh, our motor pool. Uh, gunnery sergeant uh, was looking for somebody to drive a jeep on a mission and I volunteered. With five or six days to go? Yeah. And yeah. was the mission out in the combat area? Yeah. And Why uh, in the world did you do that? <laughs> young and young and dumb? Yeah, it's just something exciting to do. So we I think there was three jeeps, and we went to uh, 
down by the harbor and picked up uh, a bunch of uh, Navy and, and Marine Corps very high ranking officers and the uh, the 9th Engineer Battalion, uh, 3rd Marine Division, uh, was packing up and they were shipping out the next day, uh, going back home. They were, they, they were pulled out. So, all this brass, I wanted to go out and see what it was like and, and so we were probably halfway there and, uh... Halfway to the pier to pick them up? No, or? halfway to, uh, it was, it was, uh, not sure where, what area they were in. I know they were south, southwest of Da Nang. Are you driving or are you just I'm driving, I'm chauffeuring, uh, and, uh, the gunnery sergeant in front of me was chauffeuring, and I think there was another guy behind, behind me. So we had three Jeeps with, you know, all this, these high-ranking officers. And uh, the lead Jeep took some sniper rounds. And, uh, you know, the idiot gunnery sergeant in that first Jeep uh, stopped his Jeep. And he had a 45, he had an M16. He had a grease gun, which was a 45 thing that came out of World War II, and he wanted to get in a, in a gunfight. Well, when he started slowing down, I went past him. I went around him and so did the one behind me. And I, there was, you know, there was no reason <laughs> to stop. Did you guys draw fire as you went around him? No. Uh, not that I know of. I just we just know that he, you know, he drew fire and uh, decided thought he was going to pull a, a John Wayne move or something. And and but yeah, they ended up following us and and we got out of there. But and any of the convoys that uh, you rode shotgun. Were you involved in any uh, attacks or any booby no, traps? No, they were pretty mines? peaceful. It was like a Sunday drive. Uh, uh, went to uh, Hill 55, which was, uh, I got made two trips there. Spent the night there a couple times. And uh, the first time I was there, I was in there. Uh, Chow Hall. And I was up getting a, a glass of milk, a cup of milk or something, and somebody yelled my name. And I looked around, and it was uh, a buddy from high school, from grade school. Oh, really? So what grade school in West Virginia uh, or Ohio? No, in Ohio, Lincoln Elementary in Dayton. And uh, so that was. Uh, that was odd. Then I ended up running into several guys that I'd went to school with over there. But now were they Marines or were they? They uh, were Marines also. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the trips to uh, Hill Fifty Five uh, were pretty uneventful, uh, except for one time when we spent the night. Uh, we left the next morning heading back to uh, Da Nang and I was in the lead vehicle, driving the lead vehicle and uh, uh, a jeep came up behind us and just kept honking the horn, honking the horn and I was driving down the center of the road and uh, I finally got tired of his horn and uh, moved over a little bit and uh, he got around us, and I we probably flipped him off. He was <laughs> uh, he was a, an Arvin officer. He was by himself, and uh, probably fifty yards in front of us after he passed me, uh, he had a landmine in the road or off the side. 
in the road. So, you know, that was one less of an officer because he was so impatient. That could have been you. Yeah. Yeah. Could, as you're driving, uh, riding shotgun, uh, you're driving over these roads, uh, uh, are these roads or are these just two tire ruts going? Uh, no, they were roads. They were, they were dirt. Dirt roads. Uh, Could you tell anything about the contour of the road that there might be uh, mines uh, laid ahead of you? No, they, uh, they were the the uh, engineer battalions that were in Vietnam uh, ran mine detectors uh, uh, along the roads as soon as they could in uh -huh. the mornings, and uh, so you pretty much. You know, it's not like the IEDs that are going off and, and killing and maiming uh, our soldiers over in, uh, in the Afghanistan. Uh, you know, they just, uh, it just there wasn't a lot of, of those that I recall happening. Uh-huh. Uh, that was a close call for you. Eh, yeah. Uh, came out okay. Well, let me let me ask you this: based based on his route of travel uh, and his wheelbase, uh, would your uh, would your vehicle have hit the same mine? Was your t tire base uh, smaller, wider? Uh, wider. We were. Uh, I was driving at a uh, deuce and a half, which is a, a two and a half ton uh, truck. And uh, he was just in a, a little uh, Jeep. So wherever he went, he, he, he hit the jackpot. And uh, we didn't. Uh, Did, uh, was he dead right away? I mean, you couldn't. Oh, yeah. You couldn't stop to help him. You just. Uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I had pictures of it. <laughs> And I don't know whatever happened to him, but it was, uh, yeah, he, there wasn't much left of him. Uh-huh. And uh, Jeep was just mangled. Now, was that, was that one of our Jeeps, or did they have their own Jeeps? Well, their Jeeps were our Jeeps. Uh, and then we supplied, we supplied the, uh, we supplied South Vietnam troops and equipment and uh, ammunition and food and everything. And uh, China supported uh, North. North Vietnam. So <laughs> did you uh, come into contact with any uh uh, in North Korean or uh, North uh, Vietnamese Viet Viet Cong, uh, prisoners? No. Not that I know of. Uh -huh. uh, the last unit I was with, uh, now the, the places I, around the Nang where I was at were, you know, fairly secure. Uh, we, uh, we got rocket attacks a lot. But uh, we had the uh, majority of our guys spoke a foreign language. And uh, a couple of them in, in, in my unit spoke Vietnamese. And uh, one of them was in the barber shop one day. And uh, two of the barbers were talking about where they were going that night, what they were planning on doing. Now were these barbers Vietnamese? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he immediately went and notified the CO, commanding officer, that uh, two of the two, the two barbers were planning on, uh, uh, you know, doing something, uh, a sapper attack or uh, try to invade in some some base somewhere. So uh, they sent 
sent guys up there to arrest them. So, so they were really North Vietnamese? Yeah, they were sympathizers. Uh -huh. But I think that was the first uh, actual war that uh, you know that that we were in that uh, you didn't know who in the hell was the enemy. Uh, they all wore black pajamas. They all looked the same. My brother was wounded in uh, the time he was there, and uh, he was on a convoy, and they were going through a small vill village, and uh, he was in the last truck. And as they passed by, this little group of kids that some of the guys were tossing candy to, uh, one of the little ones, uh, he probably he said he thought he was probably about uh, six years old, uh, threw a hand grenade in the back of the truck. Oh. So. Was there anybody in the back of the truck? Yeah. yeah. Guys killed back there? Yeah, I know he was wounded. And I, he doesn't talk about it, and he was a medic, but he he's never, ever said anything about Vietnam. The only thing I know is that he's got a purple heart, and it was because a, a kid threw a, threw a hand grenade in their truck. And uh, he's never spoken about anything. He was... Uh, is he a Marine? He was in the Army. Uh, I don't think, you know, a lot of those Army guys, they couldn't qualify for the Marine Corps, so. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> I hear that over at the command yeah. meeting. Uh, um, shoot, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. Uh, where, where does your brother live now? He lives in Dayton. Uh, still in the, uh, still in the house at, uh, that was uh, New my parents, yeah. Is he retired? He's on 100% disability from uh, PTSD and, and other ailments, uh, cancers. Uh, Is he mobile? Does he get around? Yeah, he can get around. After, uh, after this interview, if you enjoy this interview, you have to talk to him about the uh, possibility of uh, telling his story. If, if we could get him to do that. Yeah. Um, so um, you mentioned that you were under rocket attack there at, at your duty station. Would that happen at night or any time of day? Uh, <clears throat> night. Uh, they like to catch you when you're <laughs> trying to sleep. Trying to sleep. Uh, January 30th, 1969, uh, we had uh, a rocket hit right in front of the door of our barracks and uh, left a pretty good sized hole in the, in the road. And uh, so as, as we were running to the other end of the barracks, away from that area, uh, then uh, a, a rocket hit the ammo dump, which was on that end. How and, far away? And that, maybe 100 yards. But the concussion from that, you know, <laughs> came in and, and uh, you know, turned us around. And, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, I don't recall anybody actually being hurt, uh, but there was, uh, you know, one of the other ones hit the mess hall, and, and uh, I think the other part of the base was hit with one. So, <clears throat> you know, when when you're there and you're you're surrounded, or you have you have the people surrounded, and you wonder how in the heck. Are they doing this? Where are these rockets coming from? We're we're in a secure area, and, and there's guards here, there, and everywhere. You know, so you know, it's just it's got to be the uh, 
it's got to be the uh, sympathizers uh, that are firing off a few rockets and then going back home, uh, going back these, to bed. Are these uh, handheld rockets or the? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's a strange place. Was there any opportunity for us? Uh, let me uh, ask you this way. The secured area you were in, did you have any uh, native uh, Vietnamese working in there with you? Yeah, there besides was these two barbers? Yeah, there was a lot. Uh, we were actually in canvas sided. Uh, we had wooden floors and canvas siding uh, in our uh, hooches. Which are tents that we that we that we were in, and uh, each hooch had a uh, a hooch maid or girl, and uh, so they would do your laundry and and uh, and you know do do things around uh, around your hooch that needed to be done, swept up and cleaned up. And, uh, were the sides protected by sandbags or anything, or just uh, just the wood sides? We had sandbags around some of the diff some of the uh, offices, but uh, sandbags in our area was, you know, was high enough so you know nobody could crawl underneath uh, underneath it. But, uh, well, could uh, could some of those people that were working inside the camp could they uh, steal some of these uh, handheld rockets and uh, pass them through their gates nah, or anything? Basically, the ones that were uh, that were on base were, were the were the ones that were in there just trying to get information. They were uh, they weren't as uh, dumb as you know we thought they were. Uh, you know, they while we had guys learning all different languages, they had uh, people learning English, uh -huh. and most of the hooch girls. Uh, you know, speak broken English, but I think 90% of, of those people's concern or target was any kind of information that they could pass along to the, uh, to the Viet Cong. How, how were these uh, hooch girls paid? Uh, were they paid in we paid, American dollars? No, we had uh, military payment certificates. And that's how we were paid, and uh, so we'd pay them, you know, five dollars I think uh, a week, and uh, so you got you know maybe twelve guys in the uh, in that in the hooch, so you know they were getting pretty good money uh -huh. <laughs> for what they were doing. Uh -huh. uh, but they were living higher on the hog than some of their fellow countrymen in the South. Yeah. And uh, they uh, they did the laundry, your laundry, uh, in the shower, and, and the shower was a big, you know, it didn't have glass doors. It was just open. It was open, and. Uh, uh, we go in, you know, go in to take a shower, and there's, you know, three or four women uh, doing laundry. Doing laundry, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hated it because you know, when I went in there, they'd start giggling. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> so that was another first, but you get used to it and realize it's not a sexual thing. You're just in there taking a shower. Yeah. So uh, let's go back to you uh, five or six days before you're going to bail out of there. Uh, you take this Jeep, uh, you take this, was it Deuce and a Half that you were uh, you were driving when the, the uh, rock fella got uh, hit by the mine, got yeah, hit over the mine? Yeah, Deuce and a Half. Okay. Did you get back from that? Yeah, from we that got adventure? back from that okay. okay. And, uh, You said the, uh, when they could, the engineers would go out with their uh, mine-seeking equipment. Yeah, mine sweepers, clear. Uh, 
did the, did the uh, did the enemy mostly lay those at nighttime as yeah. opposed to? Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, somebody could probably sit out at Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, with a monitor in front of them and see the insurgents in Afghanistan uh, going in and out of the buildings and stuff. It's like using satellites or drones or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's like playing video games, you know. They're, and they're looking for <laughs> they're looking for, for for guys that are like expert video game players. You know, and that's, you know, it just seems like. Turn that into a profession. Seems like man never ceases to try to come up with more efficient and effective ways to kill each other. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, where do you leave from and how do you leave uh, Vietnam? You leave from Da Nang? Yeah, can Da Nang on a, uh, once again on a, you know, I think maybe it was Pan Am. And uh, you go where? And uh, well, we uh, we left Da Nang and went to uh, Okinawa. And uh, we were only supposed to be there like overnight or something, and then ship back to California the next day. Well, start back that next day. Sounds like there's a butt there somewhere. It's supposed yeah, to. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> We had a layover in, in uh, Honolulu, but uh, yeah, the, you know, all these guys are on there, and uh, boy, you know, the the, the elation uh, you feel when when that airliner lifts off the ground. And it's, it's now you, you mentioned Okinawa and Honolulu. Did you go to Okinawa first in Honolulu? Yeah, we went to Okinawa, and. Uh, you were only supposed to be there, right, I think, uh, overnight or something, and uh, a typhoon, typhoon hit Okinawa, and uh, man, I thought the monsoon season was bad in, in Nam, but then uh, that typhoon just dumped and dumped and dumped the rain. So we ended up being there about four days, and. Uh, then we boarded a flight and uh, flew to uh, Honolulu, and uh, we were changing planes, and the other plane wasn't there yet, so they heard the sound, and we sat outside the doors of the airport. We weren't allowed in the airport. Did they tell you why you weren't allowed in the airport? No. Uh, you know, we. Did you find out later why you weren't allowed in there? Uh, probably because we were baby killers. I don't know. Uh, so from but you know, Honolulu the guys went. thirsty, the guys are hungry. we we need to go to the bathroom, and we sat out there on that hot concrete for probably three or four hours before our plane got there. So you couldn't even uh, go to use the restroom facilities? You couldn't get anything to eat inside? Nope. Couldn't get anybody to bring you nope. anything out to eat? Nope. We were... Who, who gave you that we order? We just stay right there. One of your officers? Yeah. Well, let's go back to Vietnam for a minute. Uh, while you were there for that year, uh, how, was, how was your food there at your base? We had decent food. We had... We actually had... Uh, mess halls and uh, yeah, the guys the guys did a real good job with uh, what they had uh, you know the I think the Air Force probably had the, the best food then the Navy would be neck below them and then uh, they'd be a Marine Corps and then Army so you could definitely tell a difference in mess halls. Uh -huh. uh, of course, I was at, at uh, I only spent a week with the Air Force uh, learning about some of the p 
specific equipment they used and uh, yeah they knew how to they knew how to eat and their enlisted club was just like being back here in the states they had slot machines they had pool tables they, anything you know I guess a lot of it's just to take your mind off of things uh -huh. and, uh, and we were we were right next to the morgue. Well, as, as critical as your job was over there with, uh, you know, you were relaying uh, communications, did you ever have a chance to eat with any of the brass uh, with the Marines? Mm -hmm. No, I, I had, you know, some conversations with, uh, you know, some of the officers in my unit, but yeah, I never never approached any of the big shots that would have been down in the command bunker. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's bring you back to the States and uh, where did you land? Landed in uh, El Toro, which is uh, right near Los Angeles. Now, was that a base? Yeah, Air Force Base. And, uh, and uh, did you have any any communications with the public there and how they treated some of these returning uh, no, baby, kill uh, baby killers as they called them? No, I, I had that uh, even before I went to Vietnam in San Diego. I, had, I encountered uh, people yelling that in San Diego. But I got, uh, we landed, I got a, I think they took, took a lot of us on in a bus to uh, LA International and uh, the same girl that I <laughs> that I broke up with and, and joined the Marine Corps over uh, was a, uh, a dancer uh, a, a ballet dancer and she was in a show in uh, Carlsbad New Mexico so I uh, I flew to uh, Phoenix, and then on to Carlsbad, and... How did you know she was going to be there? Had you been communicating with her? Yeah, the writing letters, uh, back and forth. Uh, did you write home often to uh, your mom? I, I tried to write somebody every day. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes it would be on a, a cardboard box piece of cardboard uh -huh. uh, from the uh, sea rations and just cut cut a square off and, and write free in the upper right corner and I return address in the normal spot and uh, send it to whoever and uh, went through just like a postcard. Did you uh, keep any kind of a diary of your experiences over there? No. Your brother to keep any kind of a diary. Okay, you go down to you go down to see your uh, the girl you left to, to become a marine, and did you see her down there? Yeah, yeah. And uh, what transpired at that meeting? Well, it didn't go as I hoped. Uh, you know, to be to be taken out of. Uh, a war zone <coughs> and and being back among the the round eyes Americans is a is a maybe a culture shock it's a, you don't know you don't know how to act uh, and that's uh, I think that's that's a lot of the problems with uh, with guys with PTSD is they don't uh, there's not a program set up or there wasn't a program set up where you could be debriefed and attempt to talk to clergy or counselors or anything. It's bang you're here and there you're there and and uh, that's it. Uh, 
So things didn't go well with your former girlfriend. Uh, well, yeah, and I'm not sure exactly why, but my brother that was in, in Vietnam uh, was a police officer in San Antonio. And the plan all along was he was going to he was going to come up to Carlsbad and, uh, and pick me up at some point in time. So I called him and uh, he came up and uh, we sat around in the kitchen of his apartment where her and some of the other gals were staying. And uh, yeah, just packed up and we went out and and, and his. Uh, car and drove back to uh, San Diego or uh, San Antonio for a couple days and then uh, drove back to Dayton. Well, you and he drove back? Mm -hmm. All right, what what did you do when you came home back to Dayton? Did you, did you get a job or did you uh, just kind of leave for a while? And I still had a year and a half to go. Uh, I wanted to, to uh, extend my tour over there and uh, the captain wouldn't uh, he wouldn't authorize it he uh, he had a feeling that you you spent your time over here you spent your year over here uh, you're going home I'm not authorizing you to stay so uh, so what'd you do to fill the other year and a half? Time. Yeah, I went to uh, Camp Pendleton, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Uh, I was with the radio battalion there, the sub base, Camp Geiger. And uh, got. Uh, what did you do there? Were you teaching other. Uh, uh, re just uh, repairs. And you know, and helping out in the office, uh, since I could type, because I worked on the teletype machine, so I could type. So you know, I was also used in the office when needed, and uh, <clears throat> so that was that would have been in uh, September. Uh, With what year? Seventy. September seventy. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, spent time there, and then uh, in uh, '71, uh, the the gal that uh, I that I had uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps over and went to visit in uh, uh, New Mexico. New Mexico. Uh, Somebody told me she was getting married, so I drove drove home that weekend, and uh, yeah. I was going to be the knight in shining armor. I was going to ride a horse right into the church, but <laughs> <laughs> but what? No, nah, I just uh, I, I, I had a I think I just had a lot of beers that weekend. And uh, yeah, we would we would occasionally run into each other here and there when when I was home or even after I got discharged. Uh, but that weekend, uh, I went back to to Camp Lejeune, and uh, <laughs> you know, I was going to show her. I went out and, and met. Uh, and a go-go girl, and uh, we, <laughs> we eloped and went to South Carolina and, and got married. <laughs> How long after you uh, met this go-go girl no, did you get married? A couple weeks. And how long did that last? And she, that was in September, and uh, she became pregnant real quick. And uh, we were we were at the Navy Hospital there at, at camp, and uh, 
the doctor mentioned that you know how far along she was. And I, you know, I might be a marine, but I'm not a real stupid marine. And uh, the months just didn't add up. And she didn't know he told me that. So I, I kept, I really kept giving her an opportunity to, you know, come. Come clean. Come huh? clean and, and admit that, you know, the baby wasn't mine, but she didn't. So the day I got out of the Marine Corps, we went up up through Virginia and I dropped her off at her sister's house. And supposedly she was still three months to go, according to her numbers. And I dropped her off on a Friday and uh, Monday afternoon I got a phone call from her sister that uh, she's having a baby. I said, really? So, <laughs> so that was the end of the number one right there. But, uh, and she, you know, I was getting phone calls from, from the child. Matter of fact, I was contacted about three years ago. So that was 72 to 2014 or something. Uh, this, this boy was still calling occasionally and wanting to meet me and this thing. She had uh, led him to believe that you were really his dad? No, yeah, I kept telling him, you know, you need to, you really need to sit down and talk to your mom. You really need to talk to your mother. But anyway, so I got, we got married to, and, uh, I got promoted in uh, December of 71 and uh, got out and that's when I drove, drove her to her sister's house. So, yeah. So you leave her at her sister's and you come back to Dayton? Or where you I told her I'd, I was, I was going to go to Dayton and I was, I'd get an apartment. As soon as I got an apartment and a job I would uh, come back down and and get her but yeah I didn't do that the numbers didn't work out so you uh, let that yeah go by the boards that did you get a divorce did she get a divorce yeah we got I, I filed uh-huh and uh, so where'd you work when you came back to Dayton uh, I got a job with the post office First, I got a job as a union apprentice carpenter. And, uh, boy, you know, it was interesting work. Uh, I really enjoyed it, but when it's raining or snowing and there's no construction going on, uh, man, those guys, they just, they would hang out and they'd, they'd just spend all day in the bars. And, because uh, they had nothing else to do, and I didn't. Yeah, I needed consistent paychecks, so uh, yeah. So I I applied and got hired by the post office. How long did you work for the post office? Started there in '72 and uh, got injured in '70. Uh, 79 or 80, I think, is when I uh, I gave up the post office. And uh, what did then, you do for the post office? Were you a mail carrier? Or did yeah, you work? mail carrier. Here in Dayton. Mm-hmm. And that was that was the beginning of 28 jobs that I had from 1972 until 2015, 28 jobs, three wives, so yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite interesting uh, that oh. I, I, 
that I've come out as well as I think I've come out considering uh, some of the goofy things I did. Well, we won't go through all your 28 jobs. What, no. are, what are some of the kind of jobs you did do? Oh, I sold cars, sold houses, sold uh, welding equipment, uh, did inventories, uh, worked at gas stations, uh, worked at Elder Beerman's selling the men's department. Uh, and the Elder Beerman's uh, is a department store. Department store, yeah. And, uh, Worked at uh, uh, King Quick for a couple of months. Sold flooring supplies. That was probably the longest. I think I did that from uh, for about five years. I think that was the longest I. Well, no, I sold steam-related equipment and. Uh, Steam related, mm -hmm. uh, and, and to paper mills, they use steam in the process, and uh, so once again the girl comes back in the picture. <laughs> her, her brother owned the company, and and, uh, and she was. We were at a, a class reunion, and, and she said, uh, you yeah, know told me that her brother had his own company and, and she knew he was looking for somebody and I knew him. So it was kind of a no-brainer that he would hire me. And uh, Was she still married to the guy that you were going to come in as a... No, he, uh, he ended up being an abuser and she left him. And uh, see, that's one of those things about I'm available, she's not. She's available. I'm not. It, it's. This wasn't meant to it's be. It's been that way for 50 years. And and in 1990, we were going to do it. I wasn't married yet. She was uh, very unhappy, and she was going to move from California back to here, and her sister was going to go out fly out and they were going to rent a truck and and come back. Well, at that same time I was dealing with uh, my four-year-old stepdaughter uh, being molested. And I just couldn't bring myself to abandon her at that time. Uh -huh. So that didn't work out. Then we were going to attempt it again uh, a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago now. Yeah. And my wife 15? had a my yeah, and my wife had a heart attack. And since then she's had three strokes. Wow. So you know, I have to, I, I made a vow to take care of her and and uh yeah. Doing that too, taking that care was, of her. It just wasn't meant to be, was it? From one yeah. thing to another. It's not done yet. It's only been 51 years. <laughs> <laughs> her family's got good genes. Her mother's, her mother's 96 right now, and she's like a second mother to me. And uh, then her sister's 98. So, yeah, her mom and her aunt. That's that's a long time. Yes, right. So that's another 25 years. Well, how old were your folks when they passed away? My dad was 73 and my mom was 81. So, yeah, he he died from a heart attack and uh, she had a uh, uh, not an embolism, but something that needed surgery to clear up. And she was tired, and she said, I've had enough surgeries. I'm not having another one. So she went home and probably 
three months later she died. Died. But uh, well, how about you? You got uh, you had one child, one natural child, and two, two, two natural. And what are their names? Uh, William John is my son. He was born in 1975 to my second from a second wife, and. Uh, Susan Marie was born in 77. And what's Susan Marie's last name today? McLean. McLean? Yep. And what's your son do? He, uh, he goes back and forth from uh, delivering from, for Amazon and, uh, and driving Uber. Uh, and he, he, he does pretty good. He's he's just had he's had bad luck, a lot of bad luck. Just he spent so many years in the fast food industry and kept trying to talk him out of there and get out and get a real job. But he'd he go out and get a real job and you know something would always happen that he you know ended up either quitting or being let go. And so you live in the area. Yeah, yeah, he, he's still in, in uh, Dayton. He's he's staying with his mother. And, uh, Does he have any children, any grandchildren of yours? He has uh, three daughters and uh, one granddaughter, who's my great, great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. What's your granddaughter's name? And uh, her name is uh, uh, Serenity Noel. That, that's the great granddaughter. Mm -hmm. How about the granddaughters? Uh, uh, Nautica Renee is the uh, oldest, and, and she's the one that has the baby. And then there's a 13 year old uh, Teddy that lives in Fairborn, and four year old Paisley that lives in Lebanon with her mother. And then my What's daughter it? Susan is married to Tom, and she has Nathan, that's a senior at uh, Fairborn High School, or Xenia, Beaver Creek High School. And she also has a 13-year-old daughter named Emily. And uh, then my stepdaughter has uh, an 11-year-old, uh, Ethan. And, What's uh, your stepdaughter's name, that one? Miranda, Miranda, Miranda Nicole. And the last Turner. name is what? Turner. Turner? Yeah. And she has a couple of kids? Yeah. She has Ethan, that's 11, and uh, Anthony is uh, just turned four. And does she live in the area? She lives in Middletown, uh, and uh, just two terrific little boys, really, are, love their, love their, love their brothers. Uh, uh, Ethan has a stepbrother. Uh, and uh, so he's got he's got two two younger uh, bro brother and a stepbrother, and uh, he's just so good with them, and they just love him to death. So. Yeah. So do you have little family get-togethers? Uh, yeah, I've <clears throat> never uh, I've never believed in uh, you know these people that get divorced and then they spend their whole life being miserable and complaining about them. Uh, ever since we we divorced uh, in '82, we've never uh, really gotten mad at each other. We showed up at the wedding. We showed up at uh, births, uh, birthday parties. Uh, you know, Christmas. They just, you know, me and me and the current wife and. Uh, Former wife, uh, <laughs> get along fine. Good, good. That's that's the way it should be. So, wh when did you uh, marry your current wife? Nineteen ninety-five. Uh, she worked outside the home during your marriage. She did. She was a uh, X-ray tech. Where? In uh, Middletown. 
at uh, at uh, Atrium Hospital. It was first. It was uh, Middletown Hospital, and then uh, it became it moved. Well, they built the new hospital, the Atrium Medical Center, and uh, closed down the the uh, Middletown Hospital. And so she was an X-ray tech, and uh, she had her heart attack, and. Uh, Uh, she eventually, while she was off sick leave at the hospital, she, when she was feeling better after a few months, she was she was kept calling, wanting to know when she could come back to work, and they kept putting her off and putting her off. Then find out that that they fired her while she was off on sick leave. Uh. So. Uh, we saw an attorney and, and paid him some money, and, and uh, then he just came back and said, Man, this, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to do anything. And, Heart attack uh, wasn't related to her employment. Yeah, then. stress or anything. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, the attorney, I think, I think the, uh, he, uh, I think attorneys can go, like he probably went to the hospital and talked to the, the attorneys that, that worked for the hospital and said, hey, I've got somebody uh, getting ready to sue you guys. And, you know, well, here's 20 grand, make it go away. And uh, so I was told before, if you go out of town, get an attorney out of town, somebody that doesn't know anybody around here, doesn't know anybody at that hospital. But So she ended up being making, from going from $27 an hour and doing a job she loved to uh, working at Meyer. Absolutely hated it. And uh, she so Meyer's there. one of the big box stores? Yeah, yeah. And she... Uh, you know, after her first stroke, uh, she was done. She uh, she can't work anymore. Well, how is she now? Is, uh, she's is she mobile and she's mobile, mobile. <laughs> and uh, you know, I've got to dress her and and uh, and help her with with things. And uh, but she. Some places I, I use a wheelchair to take her around, and some places, uh, you know, if it's not a long walk, she can use a cane. Can she use a walker sometimes? Yeah. Well, no, we've, we've, but she, uh, I don't know how long you've been here, but we've been in this interview about an hour and a half. Is there's, does she need somebody at home to help care for her? She's fine. I can usually leave her for about three hours. Okay. But, uh, yeah, she's fine. And uh, so yeah, and then she's had two two other strokes since the first one, and she's not. They took her driver's license because of her vision impairment. How old is she now? Fifty six. Fifty six. Yeah. And that's not good. That's no. Good. Well, let me let me take let me take you back to your military uh, for a moment. Uh, did you? Um, do you have any medals, certificates, or awards that uh, you earned while you were in the military? Not individual awards. Uh, we had, uh, I think we got seven medals, but they were, uh, they were unit medals. Okay, like what? Uh, I got uh, Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry, uh, got a presidential unit citation, Got uh, good conduct ribbon, uh, Vietnamese service ribbon with three stars. Well, what's the three stars mean? Uh, how many campaigns you were involved with. All right. So I was involved in four. So the ribbon counts as the first one, and then I got three gold stars on on the right. on it. And uh, yeah. I qualified as a as a sharpshooter. That's in the middle. 
I missed expert by three points on the rifle range. Uh, Tell me about these three, the, 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 four, the ribbon and the, and the four stars. Uh, what combats were you in to get to earn those? We haven't really talked about those. Yeah, I, uh, I can't recall what the four of them were, but it was, you know, we were in support of those four. So some of the times, you know, when I was running there, when I ran the re radio relay station, uh, during that time, we supported all all four of the branches. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if they were involved in in uh, whatever operation they were involved in, uh, you know, anybody that supported them also uh, was entitled to. Uh, money. Well, you, you guys were a very important part of their success for whatever they were doing. Uh, attacking or defending themselves uh, without your uh, relay yeah. uh, could have lost a awful lot of awful lot of fellow soldiers I lost uh, I lost four uh, four guys from my uh, boot camp platoon uh, I lost three from high school and uh, three from my unit and about a month and a half ago I was looking at a uh, through a military catalog and they came out with these are called challenge coins and, and uh, like every unit has challenge coins and it's just the show where you have been we'll or somebody so somebody that uh, you, can you get that? So this was this was as the picture was in in the uh, the catalog. And then you could you could flip it. So when I flipped it, you know the immensity of the wall, and there's. There's over 58,000 names yeah. on that wall. Yeah. And this is just a very small section of that wall. Yeah. And my buddy's name's on that coin. So it just has names. Which, which one's your buddy? Mundell. What was his first name? Gregory. Greg Mundell, M-U-N-D-E-L-L. -L. Mm -hmm. And what branch of service was he in the Marines? Yeah, yeah we were in boot camp together. And do you know where he was when uh, he was killed, or or any of your other yeah. fellows? Yeah, yeah, I know where all of them were killed. Uh, but I uh, I looked up what I could find about Greg and uh, found out he was he was married just prior to he, he to him being shipped out to Vietnam and. Uh, he only lasted 20 days, and uh, you know. Did you know how he was? Was he in a firefight, or was he just he shelling was, of the camp? Or you know, he was he was a small arms fire, and uh, so I uh, I contacted his family in Indiana. And uh, yeah, because I I ordered two because I wanted to present one to his family. And uh, I have his his niece. I've talked to her and sent her messages. And uh, she can't get her dad, who would be in his brother, uh, to call me. And I don't know if if he just doesn't want to bring that up. Or thinks I'm trying to con him into something, but I haven't told him what it is. I just told him I had something uh, concerning Greg that I, I would like to present him. So, 
I think I'll try her again, and uh, if nothing happens, uh, I know what cemetery he's in over in Indiana, and I'll just go and leave it on his headstone. Well, and, uh, uh, as a last resort, uh, who am I to tell you what to do? But I suggest tell him, and if you don't hear back, tell the niece what it is, yeah. and maybe she wouldn't tell her dad, but uh, she might encourage him more to uh, let you come up and give it to him. But it's the commemorates the 50th anniversary of the war in Vietnam. What, what can you tell us about your other buddies? Uh, how they, how they I had are. another one that was, uh, he was, uh, he was a stud. He was our, uh, the honor man in our uh, boot camp platoon. Just a good looking kid, you know, well developed. Uh, he made PFC and boot camp and uh, he lasted 27 days. Was he killed by small arms fire too? Yeah. What was his name? Robinson. Roberts? Robertson. Robinson? Don, Donald Robinson. Where was he from? I'm not sure. Where was Mundell from? Indiana. How about the other two fellows? Do you remember anything about them? One lasted almost a year. Another one, uh, like seven months. So those are the only four from, from my boot camp. Then, uh, what were there? What were the other two guys' names? Uh, John Pena and uh, Pena. Mm -hmm. uh, did I spell his and name? P E N A. Okay. And then, uh, oh, I just looked at his name today. Or his last name was Or. O R R. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I don't know where he was from either. But well, I, I, I do, but I, I, I can't recall where they had. Then I had uh, three from my high school uh, died. Uh, Marines. Marines. Uh, one ar us. one army. Uh, you tell us their names. Army and in, in uh, uh, Orville Kitchen was a second lieutenant in the army, and he he was killed in '67. Don Brewer was uh, 18. He was there 39 days, and he was attempting to resupply other guys in a firefight with ammunition, and he was uh, he was killed by small arms fire. Was he on foot or in a vehicle? He was on foot. They had. Uh, Helicopter came in to came in the next day to, to pick up the deceased and uh, some wounded, and he he did he wasn't on that chopper, but that one started the lift off and then just crashed. Overloaded or uh, from fire? I don't know. I just know it was that you know that, that this helicopter had crashed and uh, and some of the guys that had been wounded the day before were were killed. How about your third third schoolmate? What was his name? Hartwick Poole, P O O L E, and he was a marine. And uh, he was with a unit that was out trying to help the civilian population. 
and uh, yeah, he was also killed by small arms fire. I had uh, one of the guys in my unit uh, chopper crashed, was shot down, and uh, he was coming from Dong Ha to Da Nang to go on R&R, &R, his rest and relaxation. And, uh, he was killed in the, in the ensuing crash. And, uh, I heard those helicopter pilots uh, didn't have a real long life expectancy over there in Vietnam. They, you know, a lot of those guys were 19-year-old Army warrant officers that just did unbelievable things. Uh, yeah, they they just they had no fear. They went in the hot LZs, drawing being fired at and rockets being shot at them and they went in anyway to to pick up wounded troops and, and get them to field hospitals. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything we haven't talked about that uh, your relatives, ancestors, friends, classmates well, might be my, interested uh, in hearing? My fourth great-grandfather married the daughter of Queen Aliquippa. Have you ever heard of her? No. She was the, the head of the Seneca tribe, Indians. And she was friends with George Washington from his uh, surveying days. Is that right? And her tribe assisted uh, George Washington at Fort Necessity during uh -huh. that battle. Uh huh. Against the French. Now, is this recorded in some family history, or is this just uh, come down by word of mouth? Well, she's in a lot of books. Uh, <coughs> articles been written about her. Uh, and how do you spell her? Aliquippa, name? Pennsylvania, is named oh, after I've, her. Well, I've heard of Aliquippa. Yeah. yeah. And so her daughter's name was Summer Eve. And uh, my fourth great grandfather married her. And then on my, uh, my, that was my paternal side of my dad's family. On the maternal side of my dad's family, uh, we traced it back to uh, uh, Braveheart. Braveheart, mm -hmm. over in Scotland? Yeah. About my, that? Uh, his brother was my, uh, would have been my mm -hmm. uncle. And he ended up getting the same fate <laughs> as his brother. They were both drawn and quartered. Oh gosh! Uh, by London Tower, and their heads were cut off and put atop the London Bridge. <laughs> Jeez. So I've had a little bit of history in the family of, of Absolutely. battles. Absolutely. And uh, one day I hope to go to Scotland and. Uh, see the family castle yeah. and so some of the areas uh, around it. Uh, when did your family, your, your dad's family or your mom's family first come over to the United States? Well, I know they were here during the revolution because I had a, a grandfather that, uh, that was a fifer in the Continental Army at 10 years old. So they were here. What was his name? Jacob. Jacob Stone King. And uh, obviously he survived. So, uh, yeah, he survived. <coughs> so it's it's a <coughs> it's a wild family tree. It's you got some interesting things in it. Interesting uh, background. Interesting family. Golly, Ned's. Uh, well, you know, we're almost out of time, so. I want to thank you again. Well, thank you. And thank you for your service. Well, 
I would do it again.